Hey guys, today we're going to talk about, guess who, Prince. We only have a few records by Prince, some of his big ones from the uh, Warner Brothers years. Double record set, 1999. But uh, this is really one of my documentary reviews, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about a documentary I just watched on Tubi the other day called Slave Trade, How Prince Remade the Music Business. I think that's what it's called. That came out in 2014, just two years before he died. Uh, I mentioned in my other video that you can watch a lot of good stuff on the Tubi app for free. You can download, download that to your phone or get onto their website. And uh, lots of great documentaries and music shows and all sorts of stuff. So free plug for Tubi. I'm not endorsed. They haven't sent me any money. They just let me watch their videos for free. Grabbing some uh, tea over there, guys. Thanks. Okay, so you're asking, what is a white guy doing talking about Prince? Let's change that question up a little bit. What's a Jewish guy doing talking about the music business? Okay, does that make a little more sense now? I'm not exactly a music business guy, even though I worked at three different record stores during the uh, 80s and worked for Philips Polygram throughout the 90s. So my interest in this documentary is more about the music business than Prince per se. This is not the Prince story from beginning to end and why he's great. This is a story of his disputes with the record industry and how he reacted to him and how the record industry changed either because of him or in spite of him. This documentary clocks in at two hours and 55 minutes on uh, Tubi. That includes some of the DVD material tacked on to the end. So three, almost three hours. That's a very long documentary. Um, I would say this documentary is for fans of Prince and also people that are interested in sort of the evolution and demise of the record industry, which is more where I am. Certainly love Prince, but I'm not like a major, major Prince fan. These are my wife's four Prince records. I don't personally have any in my own collection. I just saw a giant crow land in my backyard, like five foot wingspan. That's pretty trippy. Okay, where was I? Talking about Prince. So the movie is called Slave Trade, and the whole thing is Prince considering himself enslaved to the deal he made with the record company, Warner Brothers at the time. Um, he felt like a lot of, rec a lot of uh, artists were taken advantage of by the record industries record companies and they didn't really understand what they were signing and they didn't realize they were signing away all of their rights to all of their creative work. Not only were they signing away their rights, they were signing away creative control. So they didn't really even have control of what they were producing. And the record industry would kind of pigeonhole you and say, you need to make funk records. Say, well, I want to make R&B records. No, you need to make funk records. You need to make them by this date and it's got to sell this many copies before we even get a penny back. So even though we think of Prince as being a relatively wealthy guy, uh, well, a superstar, he thought uh, he got chipped out of millions of dollars and could have done a lot better had he understood what he was signing. So uh, I can't go over the whole three hours with you, just a few of the high points. Um, so in 1984, when um, Purple Rain came out, June of, of 84, did I say 94? June of 84, Purple Rain came out, and I was working at the second uh, record store, which turned out to be one of the coolest places I ever worked. That's where I met my now wife. A lot of great musicians worked there. But working there during the time that Prince was, was popping and, and just, it was phenomenal. You know, I mean, people would just be coming into the store in droves to get that record. That was like the biggest thing of the year was Prince. And uh, I remember Warner Brothers, because our store was not, not too far from the music business people in, in uh, Los Angeles, you know, Burbank and Studio City. Warner Brothers people gave us a giant purple Christmas tree for the store that year. I mean, that's like, this is the, we're worshiping at the idol of Prince. That was like, Prince was so major. And then to find out that all this time, he thought the record company was taking advantage of him and they were making more money than he was. Uh, 10 years later, 1993, he got into this big dispute with Warner Brothers, and that's when he dropped the name Prince. He said, you're not allowed to call me Prince anymore. I am the symbol. I don't even have the symbol on any of these records. Uh, the love symbol, the symbol for the artist formerly known as Prince. He has no name. Do you young folks even remember that era when Prince 
told people he could not be called Prince. Uh, Prince really wanted to, and he had a lot of good ideas and, and innovations for how the music industry was going to evolve. And back in probably the early 90s, he was the first person saying, computers, internet, that's going to destroy your record business. You don't know it yet. He was right. He was absolutely right. He predicted the downfall of the record business because of computers and file streaming and sharing and all that stuff. Uh, and he tried to take advantage of this. I think even before the Apple Store came out, he started his online service. He experimented with a couple of different online services. Some of them were subscription based. Some of them were, you know, you download. Uh, lots of different innovative ways to distribute music to people. And during that period, he was creating a lot of records that were really just for his subscriber base that aren't really well known and uh, for general release. So I don't know if they were digital only or CDs, but there's a lot of rare prints music made during that period that uh, most of us are not going to hear too often. Maybe they're on the streaming services now. I don't know. So I'm trying to remember all the innovations of his. He said the music industry was going to die because of computers. In essence, he was correct. He, he um, tried to monetize the online experience way before the record industry figured out that that was the way things were going. He um, also uh, distributed his music in other kind of weird ways that often would annoy other record companies. Like he would give away a lot of CDs. Uh, you buy a Prince ticket for the concert, you get a free CD. And then that CD counted to the uh, rating system that they use in Billboard magazines. So it's like, how did Prince sell all these records? He didn't get any airplay. Well, he got, uh, he gave away a CD, but he can say that he charged you for it because it was part of the ticket price. I mean, that's, that's one example. There's like a dozen examples in this movie of uh, things that he did that were different, innovative, kind of annoyed the record business, the record stores, really an innovative guy and a shrewd businessman. Uh, he would put CDs onto a magazine. He would like, okay, make an agreement with a magazine to, okay, you're going to do a big article about me, give away my CD to everybody who buys this newspaper or magazine. So just another example of ways that he innovated in the uh, distribution of music. The other thing he innovated was uh, figuring out that you got to make your money at the shows and not the uh, selling physical, physical music. So he did a lot of tours near the end of his life that were based on the idea that I'm going to cut out all the middlemen. I don't want to deal with promoters and, uh, you know, booking agents and all these venues. I'm going to do everything myself. So him and his little team would say, okay, guys, let's do a show, 20,000 seat arena this Friday. Hey, it's Monday. There's not much. Get it done. Get the word out. We're going to fill up that theater. It might be an inexpensive ticket, but fill up that theater immediately because he didn't want to give like scalpers a long um, time frame to do their little business model. He wanted all that, all that revenue to come to him and his people, not the record company, not the promoters, uh, not the booking people, not the venue, not the scalpers. So he made a lot of money in the last several years of his life by uh, being innovative in uh, ways, to, uh, ways to promote concerts and, and ways to merchandise at concerts. So, um, you know, he played a big show in L.A. before he died, and I'm sorry I didn't go. Somebody invited me. He did several shows for 25 bucks each. I think it was at the Forum. And this was, uh, I should have gone. I'll, I'll always regret that I, I never got to see him live. Uh, but I know people who went and said it was fabulous. Only 25 bucks to see a major, major artist. That's inexpensive, but he cut out all the middlemen and got the revenue directly to himself. So uh, so Prince is not interviewed in this documentary. Uh, I guess he didn't want to cooperate with it. So there's a lot of archival footage of him being interviewed with everybody from Oprah to Jay Leno or all those type of people. Good morning, you know, NBC type shows and music industry stuff. So there, there is a lot of him speaking about his opinions about the music industry. But uh, they didn't actually get to sit down with him, even though this was made two plus years before he died. Uh, but there are some, there are a lot of interviews with people that he worked with, not necessarily big, huge name people, but musicians and producers and some journalists. So, uh, it's a very interesting movie. Um, 
but like I say, it might be too long for the casual fan. You either got to be a diehard Prince fan, or you got to be like really interested in sort of the history of the music business, as I happen to be. So Prince died tragically in 2016, um, age 57, and uh, the value of his estate and who's going to get what remains is going to be in the courts for years. Uh, the IRS is going to try to value his estate at some astronomical number uh, so they can collect a giant estate tax. He had, was it hundreds or a thousand songs that were written sitting in a drawer? And the IRS is looking at those and saying, oh, yeah, each one of those songs is worth like a million dollars. So, you know, his estate's worth, you know, three or four hundred million dollars. Well, what do they care? Well, the IRS gets 40% of your estate when you're that wealthy. 40% of giant estates. Uh, over to like $20 million. So people like Prince, and Michael Jackson, if they're worth a half billion or a billion dollars, they want to get their teeth into what could be hundreds of millions of dollars of just estate tax. And then his uh, family, he, he didn't have a will. His family is, uh, you know, different relatives are arguing about who gets what. So guys, put together a will, get life insurance, get together with a financial planner. Uh, especially if you have a lot of assets so your relatives don't spend the next 40 years arguing with each other, uh, as is unfortunately happening to Prince. He did not leave any heirs. He had two wives. He had a son who's mentioned in this movie who only lived a couple weeks, and I don't think it was well known in the media. Tragic, but the son died uh, of some rare disease or something. Um, so Prince's legacy, in addition to his music, he made a lot of contributions and innovations to the music business and the way music is distributed and monetized today. Uh, check out the video, Slave Trade, on Tubi and other platforms. Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, hit subscribe, and let me know what you think of this long ranting video about Prince. Bye-bye.